Hello and welcome to Taiwan Talks. We're bringing you the latest news and analysis from a Taiwan perspective. I'm Ian Kavat. Here's what's coming up. Huge leap in technology. First of all, how did you do this and what opportunities does this open up? The U.S.'s IBM is partnering with Japan's Rapidus to mass-produce two nanometer chips for delivery in 2027. We ask what advantages Taiwan has. Then... And of course, we also intend to provide best-in-class entertainment for our customers, in addition to movies, games and music. We envision a new in-cabin experience using our expertise of UX and UI technologies. The next generation car like this one, unveiled at CES 2023, uses Qualcomm's Snapdragon system on chip. We ask whether Taiwan is well positioned in this new market. Plus, on the US's chip bill. I'm here to express excitement about another provision of the bill, one that will bolster development of a highly skilled domestic semiconductor workforce to work in those fabs and to fuel innovation for the future. The United States is reviving its chip industry and working to build the pipelines of talent it needs. Is Taiwan doing the same? Welcome to the show. I'm Ian Kavat. Our guests today are Trey Wong Yo, Distinguished Professor at National Tsinghua University's Department of Materials Science and Engineering. She was formerly Vice President of UMC's Advanced Technology Development and formerly the Chief Technology Officer at Solar Applied Materials Technology Corporation. She was also previously Deputy Director of UMC's Central R&D and formerly on the Advisory Council for Semi Taiwan's Women in Tech, as well as former Chairman of Semi Taiwan's IC Forum and Mavis Ho, who is the general manager of IMEC Greater China and Southeast Asia, and also a semi-Taiwan technical committee member, as well as a semi-women in tech advisor. She is senior advisor of Care Her, and formerly semi-Taiwan vice president, as well as previously semi-Singapore managing director. And Tom Fifield, who joins us later in the show. Tom is the program manager at Taiwan Employment Gold Card Office, where he leads the Immigration Environment Task Force, all under the National Development Council. Um, Professor Yeo and Hi. Mavis, Hi. Hi. a very warm welcome to the show today. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. We begin the show with one of the latest examples of countries partnering for greater chip self-sufficiency. U.S. computing giant IBM and Japanese chipmaker Rapidus are partnering to deliver two nanometer chips in 2027. Government-backed Rapidus, which is also working with Belgium's IMEC to develop extreme ultraviolet lithography, is funded by top Japanese corporations such as Sony and, uh, and Toyota. In December, Tokyo also announced the launch of its inaugural R&D base for mass production of next-generation semiconductors. Can we talk about um, the factors that have made Taiwan the leader in semiconductors? Um, I, think, I think we talked about, and I think a lot of country actually started a semiconductor earlier than Taiwan. Um, but if we cut and slice right now that Taiwan has done quite well, um, a lot of people wonder why. How do we reach such success in, in this few decades? I think it's a mix of many different factors. I think Professor Yu and I talked many times about why. And I think maybe two words perfect storm is a good way to describe. There are so many different elements. Um, if we look at Taiwan, the top student, the top university talents, mm -hmm. a lot of them went to school in Tsinghua, Taida, you know, mm -hmm. Chenggong, Jiao Tong. Um, there are a lot of top students actually enter. Um, the sector. Mm -hmm. In other countries, perhaps this would not be their first choice. Mm. But in Taiwan, I think it's pretty safe to say in the last two decades, mm -hmm. those are their first choice. Mm -hmm. So that means our top talent student enters semiconductor. Mm -hmm. Another, I think, important part is the support of the society. Mm -hmm. You look at from a family standpoint, you look at from the peer standpoint. Um, when people talk about, oh, what sector you're working in? I mean, if you say semiconductor, you feel rather proud. Mm. In family, also, everyone is very supportive. So I think from um, that standpoint, uh, really is a good um, um, uh, mix mm. of why that this 
perfect storm was formed mm -hmm. um, in a way um, to, to reach that success. So P Professor Gill, obviously you um, have been a professor for many years and you've mm -hmm. actually taught these um, engineering students. Mm -hmm. um, so th there's a real sense of pride, is that right, in yeah. Taiwan's semiconductor yeah. industry. So being able to, to go into this field you know, is something that's coveted, it's something that's prestigious. Yeah, yeah. actually, uh, uh, Taiwan Semiconductor has been uh, for 40 years, right? We have very solid and robust foundation and also infrastructures. So as you remember that uh, in 1980, uh, Bob Chow from UMC, uh, he initiated the stock uh, bonus. And so a lot of top engineers joined this industry. Mm -hmm. And also he initiated the foundry but you know the Dr. Morris Chan, he's been doing so well. He is the founder of TSMC Foundry business, right? And he continues invest R and D. Mm -hmm. So you know it becomes a pride, it becomes an honor to join the semiconductor industry in the university for the students. So even the family encouraged them to join the industry. They keep questioning, why don't you go? TSMC, a semiconductor like that. Mm. So that, that's why we uh, gather, you know, we have attracted so uh, many talents uh, from the top-notch students. Mm. So they, you know, you know, they are not just that, not just they are smart and also uh, uh, they are working very hard. Mm. They are highly educated mm -hmm. and dedicated to this job and also very passionate. Mm. Mm. And, and you know what, they also have service-oriented uh, the mindset. Mm -hmm. So they can, uh, you know, like what you mentioned, the devices, they not just build a platform, they also build a derivative for different applications. Mm -hmm. So that's very important. That's how foundry works because they can they need to meet various kinds of products mm -hmm. and that build a very strong foundation. And also, you know, the system that uh, uh, our semi time semiconductor build is that the very robust and, and very flexible dynamic system. Mm -hmm. And they tied it very together. And also the, uh, uh, you know, they, they, they are very, very high efficiency on the production. Mm -hmm. And we call manufacturing technologies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and so they, the production efficiency is very good. Also, uh, that also very uh, good and seamless collaboration with like vendor suppliers and also research institute. Mm. That's why I make it so successful. Mm. Yeah, and, and this kind of combination is very hard to find worldwide. Right. Yeah, yeah. and also the, uh, you know, it's been for such a long time. Mm. It's very hard to duplicate in the short time. Yeah. Yeah. That's why we look at the bright side. Mm. Taiwan still can continue, you know, being the leading position if mm. we, we, you know, continue to put efforts on R&D yeah. and attract more talents. Right. Mavis, Professor mentioned there the very hardworking and talented engineers in Taiwan. But is it true that uh, there is an advantage for Taiwan because many talented um, engineers overseas don't want to remain in manufacturing? Um, it is the fact. Um, this is why um, in U.S. Um, organization like SEMI, SIA, they have very robust program for decades on how to bring young talent into the workforce. Um, they try to focus on STEM education, so they're more talented youngster that will consider actually entering this field. Um, and I think one of the Taiwan advantage we have not mentioned is the, the, the system that our manufacturer has built the management style and also the science parks management um, uh, gover governed from Taiwan, uh, no matter it's local government or central government. Those are actually something that are great asset that us as a Taiwan that we could also pass down as a, um, as a technique to other uh, fab, uh, manufacture in other region and I think that's something or sometimes we l discuss a little less mm -hmm. so I wanted to also bring that in mm -hmm. as a one of the advantages. Let's kind of compare now that we've summarized mm -hmm. what Taiwan has in terms of uh, its advantages its culture um, but didn't Japan have something similar to this in the 1980s mm -hmm. how come Japan lost its surely it also had hard-working talented engineers where uh, was working in the chip industry something that was prestigious or maybe not prestigious enough? 
I think along the same line, culture-wise, uh, Professor, you mentioned, I think maybe the one of the obvious differences between the two regions, um, I think in Taiwan, um, um, our uh, language education is slightly stronger. And Semiconductor is a country that it, there is not a single region can work successfully on its own. Mm -hmm. Because you have manufacture, such very focused in Asia uh, currently, mm -hmm. and you have an equipment community. They are a strong supporter of the success. And, um, and, and equipment community is spread all over the world. You have the US equipment community, the Japanese community, also the European. Mm -hmm. So when language became a barrier, then the communication certainly will take longer. Mm -hmm. So I think this is also one of the advantages that Taiwan um, community also have um, uh, compared to certain region. Of course, sometimes advantages also plays its <laughs> own, uh, it's also counter effective. You're talking about yeah. the English ability. Yes, oh, okay. yes, right. that's so, one of the character. Okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, Professor Yeo, could also one of the factors be this, um, the foundry model. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so the TSMC's foundry model that they don't compete with their customers yeah, in any other way. Yeah. Yeah. The, the customer trusts them. I think that's the... Yes, the level of trust. Yeah, the, 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 you know, Dr. Morris Chen, the founder of TSMC, I think he built a very good system on this. So the customer trusted uh, him. And also, uh, you know, the Taiwan uh, engineers, the higher managers or some manager from the United States, and they also have the mindset of Western and et cetera. And, and the engineers, they re really would like to work with uh, suppliers or the customers. That's also mindset and culture. They think this kind of service, high tech service, is really uh, an honor. Mm -hmm. So that's why I make the collaboration uh, much easier. Mm -hmm. And they like that. And they want to more exposure to you know other different cultures. Mm -hmm. um, Mavis, yeah. very briefly, last question. Sure. You know, we talked about the advantages, but what are the challenges now that Taiwan faces? I think challenges are um, in many folds. Huh? Um, we look at right now in 2000, um, 2023, there will be over. 10,000, according to the semi report, there will be over 1,022 fabs um, compared to the year before, 20, uh, about 2011. So uh, mainly on the 12 inch fabs. So there are a lot more 12 inch fab are being planned and being scheduled. Um, I think this, of course, is related to the competitiveness um, during COVID when things are not able so easily move from point A to point B. Mm -hmm. So I think every country is investing its own force of semiconductor. Mm -hmm. um, then competition, of course, will rise. However, I think every country, not just Taiwan, we're all facing the talent issue. Mm -hmm. We're all facing utility issues. Uh, water is scared. Land is scared. Power needs to be reduced, but at the same time, the needs are rising. So those are all challenges, not only Taiwan facing, but also I think global semiconductor industry are facing as well. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, still to come in the show, Taiwan must get better at attracting and retaining skilled professionals to maintain its chip leadership. Is Taiwan's gold card the answer? Moving here was an easy choice for us, and the Taiwan Employment Gold Card made it so simple. It provides resident visas and health insurance for me and my whole family. The gold card also allows me to work for any employer, receive tax benefits, and after living in Taiwan for three years, I'll be eligible for permanent residency. But first, we take a look at automotives, one of the few industries still experiencing a chip shortage. With the mass production of electric vehicles and development of self-driving and in-car entertainment, it's also a huge growth market. Taiwan's Foxconn or Honhai says its goal is to overtake Tesla in electric vehicles and it's teaming up with US chip designer NVIDIA. The chip they are developing uses artificial intelligence to process data from the car's cameras and radar sensors. This allows the car to drive on its own. NVIDIA says the technology will support virtual reality gaming for passengers at the same time. Professor Yeo, so lots happening in next generation cars, automotives, mm -hmm. as we've seen there from NVIDIA and Foxconn, also at the top of the show, Sony and Honda. Mm -hmm. um, so 
the automotive industry is one of the few ones, as we mentioned, that's mm -hmm. suffering a chip shortage. Why is that? Is it because of the growth? Oh, well, uh, the automotive device is actually in the foundry fab. That's not the sweetest products because of the, uh, in, normally in the revenue or profit in earlier. Mm -hmm. So they have been shortage for such a long time, they just, you know, recover now because of some other uh, products, more high-end products, now they are, have the inventory high. So uh, have been oversupplied for a long time. So maybe half a year. So right now, uh, the fab, they have capacity for automotive now. But if you look at automotive devices, that's not the major uh, in the foundry because uh, you look at the cell phone, it's much more than the cars. Even car has more than 100 chips per car, right? But uh, you know, it's good to see some fab dedicated for automotive devices. But if you look at the foundry, they still can tailor their devices or their uh, process to uh, manufacture the automotive devices. Mm. So what I mean is the, uh, it's not because of uh, only auto devices now is the uh, hot topic. This is because it's been shortage for such a long time. Mm. You know, they reserve the capacity later than others. Uh, but now uh, they have capacity for them. Mm. Yeah, but you know, eventually up and down is very normal in the semiconductor industry. Uh, if you look at the average, they're still going up because of demand. Uh, we, we don't, you cannot do so well without the integrated circuits. Mm. So it will eventually will grow. So now we just downturn. Yeah. So, so do I, I understand from that that you were saying that uh, the chip companies, chip makers, mm. didn't want to sell to the car industry so much because it's the lower, earlier, earlier. lower end, yeah, yeah, earlier. earlier. So, so it's, uh, they can't get as much profits from, from and that not, industry. Not because of profit. I, mean, I think they, the, the demand, the chip number from auto is not so much. Right so much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, some are the devices, they may have more profitable. Mm. And also they reserve early. Mm. All right, so and that's why they, they, you see the shortage on the so why, auto why does devices. The, why, why did the car industry not uh, you know, reserve chips in advance like other industries? Because uh, earlier, they, the most of them, they need eight inch uh, wafers. Mm. Eight inch wafers, normally uh, they are occu fully occupied. There are so many demands from uh, different applications, mm -hmm. and, and and also the uh, chip number actually compared to other like communication or uh, processor, etc. The number is not so so much, yeah, mm -hmm. not like others. Yeah. Mavis, let's talk about um, the sort of shift to electric vehicles, which will probably you know require that each car has a lot more chips um, uh, to to each car compared to a traditional car. Would that be that would be correct? So a, a traditional car versus an electric vehicle. Yeah, would, the, would the, the device will be different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. because then more sensors, uh, more uh, of the uh, like they say lidar, etc. Mm -hmm. in, immediately you can respond. Of course, they need some of very high end pro devices, mm -hmm. but uh, they need more on the sensors. Mm. Mm -hmm. So, so they will probably re require a shift in, in in their processes in terms of reserving the chips, isn't it, and forging these partnerships to ensure that yeah. that they do yeah. have this supply. Yeah. Um, uh, we heard that Foxconn, um, Mavis, is uh, is partnering with Nvidia there to uh, to create um, a self driving chip, mm -hmm. as as they as they call it. Mm -hmm. um, can Taiwan's chip makers um, also, you know, move into this industry in a big way? Uh, since we are, you know, the chip leader, can uh, why why Foxconn uh, could it partner with a Taiwanese chip maker instead? I think Taiwanese, I mean, I think Foxconn definitely is partnering with a Taiwanese manufacturer. Um, you mentioned earlier that um, um, why automotive industry was um, in such a high demand for chip, but at the end of the day, I think automotive industry is going through a large change compared to a lot of other sector. You look at the incremental changes on mobile devices or even on laptops, I think the, I don't want to say improvement, but the, 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 the changes are maybe comparatively more incremental compared to, say, car. 
there are this is the pivotal moment of uh, automotive industry going through the traditional uh, combustion engine to completely electric um, not only on the car itself, the number of sensors that is increasing, but also look at the, 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 the battery, right? The battery sector also is a, going through a humongous change. So I think because of the change are so, so dramatic that the prediction, the forecast definitely is going th also through a, um, a learning. And I believe, we believe this is one of the reasons of many that why uh, prediction is harder to be made um, in this. And come back to your question about Foxconn, um, being a um, Taiwanese company, Honghai, as a parent company, um, I believe they are definitely uh, looking into ways to work with Taiwanese manufacturer. But um, since us in academic and the research sector, so um, I think this will be a very good question for the analyst mm -hmm. and also uh, Honghai itself to mm -hmm. answer. Mm -hmm. Professor Yeo, um, so we had an oversupply of semiconductors, you know, in, in second half of, of, mm -hmm. of last year, 2022. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's expected to last into the third quarter of mm -hmm. this year. Mm -hmm. um, this, of course, has triggered a number of things, slowing demand, mm -hmm. falling prices. So, mm -hmm. you know, how bad is this for, for Taiwan? What steps do you think Taiwan uh, chip makers can take to, to weather this potential downturn? I see. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I, I think the up and down uh, in the semiconductor industry is very normal. That's been last for a few cycles in the past. You know, for healthy and also very competitive companies like Taiwan Semiconductor, for example, TSN UMC, TSMC UMC, I think they are prepared for that mm -hmm. because they've seen that for many years. And eventually, the demand will grow up. It's just a downturn. So it's a good timing, actually, for semiconductor industry to work on R&D. Mm -hmm. Because uh, in, when the business up and up, you know, upturn, you know, all the fab capacity occupied by, you know, the products, production, and there's no capacity or enough capacity for R&D. Mm. Even for the customers, new products, it's very hard to get the resources mm. and also the fab capacity to do that. Mm. And not meant to mention the fab, they have to develop a uh, different process or the more advanced process with enough capacity mm. and resources. So that's a good timing to uh, co-work between the uh, customers and also the uh, uh, manufacturers to cook uh, uh, for the next generation or based on their core competence mm. to get a very uh, good products for next wave. Mm. So I think uh, this, you know, all those companies know that. Mm. So they already prepare for that. And they are just worried not to last for too long. <laughs> <laughs> but I think they are very healthy companies. Mm. I don't worry that much about that. Mm. Yeah, this is quite normal. Mm. So Mavis, um, in, in your view, is it, is yeah. it time for innovation? Absolutely. I think innovation is key, of course, for the uh, continued advancement of um, any industry, especially in tech. Um, as Professor mentioned, that this is time, we believe that it's time to put in research and also uh, incubate talents. Mm -hmm. yeah? Uh, we talk a lot about talents, but I think research also is tricky as far as when to enter mm -hmm. because you want your fab to be fully uh, occupied with orders. But at the same time, when that is in place, then when do you actually have line to experiment mm -hmm. to invest the next IT product? Mm -hmm. So um, there are actually a couple of very good technology in the pipeline, such as gallium nitride for the power device, mm -hmm. silicon photonic for the high data um, center computing because there's so much data mm -hmm. that that needs to be computed in such a way that it doesn't suck up all the powers. Mm -hmm. So those are something that it's a good time for manufacturer to enter. Mm -hmm. um, Tell us a bit more about gallium nitride. Sure. Um, gallium nitride, I think um, it's been largely discussed as a, um, as a the next well, I wouldn't even say next. I mean, it's very much now. It's just a matter of how, um, how much the volume is going to enter 
in the production line. Currently, we see gallium nitride technology to be largely used in the power device, like the fast chargers mm -hmm. for, say, um, phone, maybe at most laptops. But going forward, um, it, it's being seen can be used in charging car. Right. It's being seen at charging data center. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are so many endless opportunity that are still to be discovered. So this technology is in the process of being um, being maximized in the next few years. Mm -hmm. And um, I think for Taiwan, since we, we talk about Taiwan advantages and how to stay competitive, Taiwan has um, um, adopted such technologies. Um, quite a few manufacturers already licensed and working on their own recipe. So I think that's a really nice news. Mm -hmm. um, so as a some of the other global manufacturer in the world. So um, yeah, again, and also another technology professor can echo is silicon carbide, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, which is another technology also is being much discussed and much uh, chosen to be um, the technology for the future. Mm -hmm. yeah. so what, what is it used in? Yeah, also in the power device yeah, power. to overgeneralize. Yeah. So, so yeah. tell us, um, Professor, about, about the issues that we have. So obviously there's lots of um, R&D &R going mm -hmm. into this. So, so what is the problem that we have? You mean the Taiwan semiconductor <coughs> industry? Um, as in the problem that we're solving, that we're coming up with the solutions for? For uh, the next? For power charging. Power charging? Yeah, I think the devices need to be uh, uh, high power. <laughs> so the, uh, you know, in scientific, we said that need a high band gap. Yeah, so that you don't burn the devices. Uh, mm -hmm. And oh, yeah, that needs some new materials instead of silicon. Mm -hmm. Silicon, you cannot, uh, sometimes you cannot have, provide that kind of high power. Taiwan is one of the region that has most amount of eight inch fat mm -hmm. in the world. So um, power device such as GAN mm -hmm. is, can be, uh, is using currently the most advanced technology are in eight inch. So to convert that into our um, facility, um, as far as the out front investment costs should be controllable and minimum mm -hmm. compared to investing a new line of 12 inch, mm -hmm. yeah, comparatively. So um, to answer your question as far as to solve, I think this is one of the um, steps that Taiwan has already taken. And should it be more? I think this is something, of course, a lot of uh, owner of a manufacturing owner are considering and evaluating. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. The, yeah. The most difficult is in the materials wise. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the fabric can be eight inch. Right now, some of them use a six inch. Yeah, so it's okay. But uh, the major issue comes from materials. It's because of new materials, mm -hmm. and for Taiwan foundries and semiconductor, that's another big issue because the technology barrier is not so high compared to uh, all the investment is not so high like the advanced technology node. So they are easy to catch up soon. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, we also you know that, that we have vapor supply on silicon carbide in Taiwan also. So that, um, you know, I, I, I would look at the bright side, that's not a major issue in Taiwan to go for getting nitro or getting nitro or uh, so get nitro and silicon carbide. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those new materials. That's the two major materials for high power devices, Correct. like uh, mm -hmm. maybe it's mentioned. As part of the Biden administration's 280 billion US dollar Chips and Science Act, the US semiconductor industry has come together with its education industry. They are building a comprehensive workforce development program designed to close America's chip industry's widening talent gap. Under the proposal, which is awaiting funding, 200 universities and community colleges will be connected to more than 1,500 chip companies with US operations. Let's hear from one of the leaders driving the program. Today, there is a shortage of qualified candidates to fill available positions in the semiconductor industry. And with over a dozen new fabs on the horizon, which will come online in the next few years, the need for additional engineers, technicians, and factory workers is only going to increase dramatically. As Gabby indicated, hundreds of thousands of new jobs to be filled. Now, it takes years to educate students and train them to be ready to contribute to the semiconductor workforce. To be ready then, we need to start now. 
That was Sujay King Leo, Dean of Engineering at the University of California, Berkeley, and Chair of the Executive Committee for the American Semiconductor Academy Initiative. Now, to help us discuss how Taiwan can attract and retain talent, we are joined by Tom Fifield, who is Program Manager at Taiwan Employment Gold Card Office, where he leads the Immigration Environment Task Force, which is part of the National Development Council. Welcome to the show, Tom. Thanks for having me, Ying. Professor Yeo, um, if I can start with you. So we've heard about how the U.S. is targeting mm -hmm. what it perceives as its shortfall in talent in the semiconductor industry. Mm -hmm. Does Taiwan have any concerns about this? Yeah, uh, actually, uh, Taiwan also has the uh, semiconductor institute in different universities. We encourage more engineers or talents to join. But as you see that uh, some people mentioned TSMC go to the U.S. that will lose talent or competitiveness. Mm. I don't think so. I think that's a good, you know, a way to expand and also give more motivation to young talents that they can have more exposure. Mm. So, you know, look at that, uh, the young talents right now, they want to be have work-life balance. They want to have a global view. Uh, so this is a very good for them to uh, say that, okay, I have another uh, uh, alternative that I can go abroad to have uh, broadened my view. Mm. So this is a so, very good. So you're good. saying that you don't see it as a brain drain. You I, see it I as thought it's a them, plus. them going and then coming back. Yeah, well, uh, the, the, their families are here. Mm -hmm. And it's a plus. And also, uh, you know, we can, most of tier one company, they uh, recruit uh, global or uh, worldwide talents, right? Taiwan, the same. Our semiconductor needs to retain our engineers, uh, both from companies-wise, give more incentive, or the work-life balance, or more interesting and global job for young talents. And also, the, uh, we have the work, uh, women in tech and workforce, and encouraging more female, because we have population 50%. And Taiwan now, the population is shrinking. Mm. So we encourage more female to join the industry. Mm. Mavis, but how does Taiwan retain top talent if going overseas means higher wages and fewer hours? That, that's really a question in a lot of people's mind, I believe, when they choose um, which job to take and in what region. And I think um, in our sector, really, is no longer considering just a job here. You're considering where you put yourself globally, right? And I think um, with, say, TSMC going to U.S., mm -hmm. um, and uh, UMC has been to Singapore for years, um, TSMC also has fab in other region. Um, I, I think this is something that, as a as a qualified um, candidate, you will consider in the next five years and the five years after you decide um, what type of experience and lifestyle that you wanted to obtain. Mm -hmm. um, it's always um, interesting when you sit at an interview, um, interviewer asks you, um, what do you see yourself in the next five years? You know, it's, mm. it's, it's harder. Mm. So is your, is your argument that because more and more Taiwanese companies are building fabs overseas in different countries, that rather than, you know, uh, triggering a brain drain, mm -hmm. this will actually help to retain? I think it's Those employees. Yeah. Yes, it's, it's enlarging the pool, enlarging the stage, yeah. mm. and we as a Taiwanese has more opportunity now than ever before, mm. because global Taiwanese company really wasn't so much there, say, 30 years ago, mm. but now there are more. Mm. So I think it's a good news. Yeah. Tom, you are the lead for the Immigration Environment Task Force um, under the National Development Council. So this is obviously your, your topic. So tell us, how does Taiwan attract, retain top talent? Absolutely. So our flagship talent visa is the Taiwan Gold Card. And uh, I'm delighted to report that it's been a relatively successful program, uh, responsible for about a doubling of the number of resident foreign professionals in Taiwan since the program started in 2018. Hmm. How, how many is that then? Uh, so we have uh, issued 6,500 gold cards approximately. And uh, at the moment, there are around 5,500 uh, gold card holders from about 91 different countries. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so is, is that short of the target? I understand there was a target of 10,000 a year. Right, we're right on target. We've uh, set very pragmatic targets and uh, the headline number that most people would be familiar with uh, that was recently announced is we're aiming to have 
100,000 new foreign professionals migrating to Taiwan by 2030. Of those, uh, there are about 20,000 foreign special professionals, which is how we categorize the gold card. We're on track to hit 10,000 foreign special professionals by the end of April 2023, and we'll probably hit 10,000 gold card holders by the end of this year. Mm. So do you want to address some of the issues that we've spoken about, including, you know, basically Taiwan is known for its long hours and perhaps on an international level, not such a high pay? Absolutely. So uh, we're recruiting internationally and what we find is that there are many different reasons that gold card applicants have for wanting to move to Taiwan. And uh, in some instances, uh, they're actually coming to Taiwan because of higher salaries. Uh, though for those who are from uh, more wealthy uh, OECD member nations, for instance, uh, we find that Taiwan's lifestyle is quite attractive. We also find that some recent global trends uh, in countries such as Australia, which is traditionally a high salary nation, have uh, caused uh, a rapid increase in the number of those who are able to work remotely. And uh, we're seeing Taiwan as a very attractive destination for those digital nomads. Mm, very interesting. Mm -hmm. Professor Yeo, um, TSMC, obviously the biggest um, chip company in mm -hmm. Taiwan mm -hmm. and globally. Mm -hmm. um, how many non-Taiwanese uh, employees does it have? Just, just to give an idea of the diversity of its workforce. Um, was it the, around about 400 plus uh, um, out, of, out of a total of... Yeah, I think they have 50, more than 50,000, more yeah. than 50,000 of mm. employees. Mm. Yeah, very, uh, relatively very few, yeah. Mm. Uh, and so, so Mavis, this, this figure, obviously it'd be great to see that grow. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think I think yeah. I think it is device makers' um, intention to grow that talent yeah. because it attract the top talents yeah. from other region, mm. other countries. So um, we've seen that number as a sideliner. We've mm. seen that number increase, mm. and this is not counting um, in the equipment material community. There are a lot of residents, so-called resident, meaning they don't work for those customers. Mm -hmm. They work for their equipment uh, employer, mm -hmm. and they spend long hours long time to stay in Xinju mm. in various area mm. to support their customers so that community definitely growing and you could see you know just spending time in Xinju area mm. yeah it's quite obvious yeah because uh, I mean the more diverse that we can make Taiwan's you know workplaces um, and society as a, as a whole the more it will attract Absolutely. you know top yeah, level that's talent yeah. Um, going back to Tom and, and, and the gold card, um, there has been some criticism um, of the gold card. Uh, there has been, uh, for instance, the, the figures that we um, have heard you, you, you quote there. So was it 5,000? 5,500, right? roughly. Yeah. Yeah. So are these um, the people who, are, uh, who are, in, are at the moment holding these, these, these gold cards? Indeed. So that's the current number of valid card holders. Uh, however, we like to get much more detailed information uh, about what gold card holders are actually doing in Taiwan. So late, late last year, we were able to conduct uh, a survey of the gold card holder cohort, and we had more than 1,000 gold card holders respond to that survey uh, to provide us information about what exactly uh, it is they're up to and also some of their motivations for moving here. And what we found is that gold card holders are incredibly globally mobile. So at any one time, there's probably around 60% of that number resident in Taiwan. But then there's 15% of people who are traveling for work or visiting their family. Uh, and then there's an additional 5% who've just been approved for their gold card and they're waiting to move to Taiwan. Mm -hmm. So in large part, yes, they're in Taiwan. Mm. So, so is this um, global nomad um, culture shift that you've that you've spoken about, and are very much, I guess, propelled by the pandemic itself? Uh, that's right. We did see a large increase in applications during the pandemic. Uh, we think that uh, Taiwan's prominent uh, role uh, as uh, fighting the pandemic, as well as it did, uh, caused that, and uh, is responsible for success in part of our program. However, what we found is that the many of those who may have come to Taiwan initially uh, to weather the pandemic uh, intended to stay for a short term, they, after having experienced Taiwan for several months, uh, decided it was a great place to live and in fact decided to stay. 
so at the moment uh, when we ask gold card holders about their future plans, 79% uh, of them plan to stay for more than one year, uh, with about 60% uh, already considering Taiwan their home or planning to stay for more than three years. Uh, there are around 16% of gold card holders uh, that have uh, left Taiwan uh, in a permanent basis, but the vast majority of those plan to maintain strong links to Taiwan, either coming back annually for a visit or, in fact, uh, maybe even spending uh, several months a year here. Mm. And do you survey those people who have left and find out the reasons why? We do indeed. Uh, so that number accounts for about 16% of the people that respond to our survey, and they have a variety of reasons. Uh, there are some that we can't fix, such as people wanting to return home to be close to family, uh, and there are some that we definitely can. So one of the areas that uh, our task force, which is a whole of government approach to try and improve our nation's migration environment, uh, is to look at any aspects of living in Taiwan. They're a little bit annoying, a little bit difficult. And uh, we're currently tracking more than 50 high level issues in areas like banking, credit cards, access to schooling, the visa system, and uh, we're actively working on those. Tom, let's talk about some of those issues in a, in a little bit more detail. Yeah. Um, so let's start with banking. Sure. What are the issues there? Well, one of the really interesting things uh, about our data is we thought the number one problem that foreign residents of Taiwan might have would be language barriers. Uh, learning Chinese, it's traditionally a more difficult language to learn, but in fact that was ranked second. Banking was ranked first. It's the number one problem for foreign <laughs> residents in Taiwan. Uh, and this is an area where we need the entire financial sector to come with us on that journey. The laws are already pretty good, but we need to become more international. Uh, so we, uh, last year, worked with uh, four banks, First Bank, Bank of Taiwan, Mega Bank, and Huanan Bank to provide a streamlined application process for gold card holders to get credit cards and bank accounts. And we're also delighted to see uh, last week, uh, Taishin's uh, subsidiary RichArt opened a uh, fully online banking uh, service for foreign residents. Uh, and the kind of foreign residents we're getting to Taiwan right now, uh, they are accustomed to doing their banking online, whereas uh, many of us in Taiwan uh, may have many friends at the branch. Mm. Mavis, just want to pick up on, on the pandemic. Um, we mentioned there uh, with Tom um, how there was a surge. Um, and you've also mentioned that um, there has been a wave of Taiwanese returning yeah. you know, over the past three years. Can you tell yeah. us a little bit more about this? Sure. I, I think I see in my immediate social circle there um, quite a lot of, um, I would say, Taiwanese linked uh, returned mm -hmm. to Taiwan. So they are not completely complete foreigner, they pay me parents are Taiwanese or they um, were born here and then returned during pandemic. A lot of them really came back to give their children Chinese education. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the big reason, at least in my circle. Mm -hmm. um, I think Tom mentioned banking is a pain point. Mm -hmm. uh, language definitely is another because compared to say place like Singapore or Hong Kong is a lot more foreigner friendly. So this is definitely an area that I think they, we as a society, um, how do we help and improve that area? I think some po government policy um, must be able to influence some changes. Um, um, but in general, um, our community are rather friendly mm. to foreigners, mm -hmm. no matter if you're Chinese link, Taiwanese link or none. Mm. So it's already a good place to start, I, I would say. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm. Um, Professor, Professor Yeo, um, we saw um, there in the US where we started off with um, Dr. Liu, mm -hmm. um, who was uh, leading up the, the, the workforce development program mm -hmm. um, for the US government. Um, and of course, you, yourself as well as uh, Mavis are women mm -hmm. in the chip industry. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about um, you know, how we can get more women into 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 the chip industry. I mean, it's it's a wonderful, as you said, it's a leading edge. You know, it's prestigious industry, um, and yet I believe the figures are maybe there's about 15% mm -hmm. only of women. Obviously, this is not proportionate to the population. So, yeah. um, how what can we do? Yeah, um, maybe I, I take a first step. Um, well, um, 
Professor Yu and I sit on the semi um, women in tech com committee. Um, I also serve as a senior advisor at CareHer, which is a uh, leadership platform for women who are ambitious in their career. When it comes to semiconductors, TSMC is not just on the cutting edge, it is the cutting edge. The company creates around 90% of the world's most advanced microchips. These tiny electrical components go into everything from cars to phones to washing machines. Odds are the device you're watching this on has TSMC tech in it. Since 2020, the most advanced mass-produced microchips TSMC put out were created using its 5 nanometer process. That's about to change as on Thursday morning, TSMC held a launch ceremony in southern Taiwan to mark the beginning of its 3 nanometer process entering mass production. That will yield the next generation of microchips. Neither the 5 nanometer process nor its predecessor had a launch event like this. So what makes the 3 nanometer so special? Timing. The 3 nanometer process launch comes as TSMC is expanding into the United States and taking its crucial technology with it. Such is the importance of TSMC to the global economy that many people have argued the company itself protects Taiwan, deterring a Chinese attack and encouraging other nations to care about its defense. TSMC's move into the U.S. has caused concern that the so-called Silicon Shield could be coming to an end. But Taiwan's economy minister is unconcerned. TSMC's customers include tech giants like Apple, NVIDIA and Intel, and even the United States Defense Department. That means there's a lot riding on the company's ability to sustain production. Today's event is an attempt to reassure Taiwanese that TSMC's future is still here in Taiwan and that the company's best technology won't be heading overseas. Yi Pan and Leslie Liao for Taiwan Plus. Today, semiconductors are used all around us. From smartphones, PCs, cars and medical machines to household appliances and high-tech weapons, the biggest household name in chips is Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company, and even American business investor Warren Buffett has bought millions of TSMC shares this fall. Why? We break it down and look at how Taiwan is leading the semiconductor business. Here you can see the share of the market by country. In 2022 so far, Taiwan has taken 64% of the global market share. South Korea is next at 17%, followed by China at 8%. Let's take a look at TSMC's position in the industry. TSMC makes chips for Apple, Intel, and other international tech giants. As the leader of the pack, you can see from this chart, it accounts for more than 90% of the 5 to 10 nanometer advanced processors market, while only one other foundry, Samsung, takes a 10% share for the top 5 to 10 nanometer chips.